Welcome to Bootstrappers, a program designed to bring you up to the minute ideas and concepts to understand what it takes to succeed in business and life. Each week we'll bring you guests and ideas you can't find anywhere else. Bootstrappers is a production of Anaquim LLC. Now strap on those business boots and join Bootstrappers with Jeremy and Gwen Aspen. All right, welcome to this episode of Bootstrappers, American Entrepreneurs. I am Jeremy Aspen, the president of Wistar Group here in Omaha, Nebraska, and here with my spouse, Gwen Aspen. She's the president of Anaquim LLC. So now, if you're if you're uh, new to Bootstrappers, uh, we talk to successful entrepreneurs about what they've learned through the trials, tribulations of starting a company, and we apply it to well to our industry and to our lives. We're kind of picking the brains of smart people. Um, so, but even if you're not in property management or you're just starting out in business, a lot of these concepts and the tips, uh, that we share, that our guests share and that we talk about, uh, really apply to anyone, um, anyone that's starting a business or ever thought about starting a business and, uh, or running a business. So, um, anyway, today we are here with. I think what a lot of people might consider one of Wistar Group's competitors, <laughs> Dave, Dave Palladino. He's also here in Omaha, Nebraska uh, with us. He is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but you are the owner of Landmark Group, uh, Palladino Development, and Dino Storage, right? That's, yep, that's correct. Yes, sir. And then, uh, so Dave was also... Now, and this is what a lot of the viewers, uh, a lot of our property management viewers, you're gonna, they're going to recognize Dave's face and be like, that's the super. Yes, that's sir. the super. Yes. That's the guy. He's that, the real deal. He's, he's the, the real super. He's actually the super from, from the, the H, reality show. The reality show on HDNet. Which it was on Netflix and a bunch of other shows. Yeah, my world blew up when I was on Netflix for. Oh my did gosh! It? I can't oh, even okay, imagine. hold on. We're going to talk about yeah. that. I want to learn and, all about that. And you're that. also weren't you the number one show on Access TV? That's correct. Yeah. So. We're so really that's who's here with us today. And, oh, and by the way, obviously a brilliant man because he's a pilot. Oh yeah. He's a pilot. You guys have that right. in common. Yeah, yeah we got that in common. We're gonna we're gonna show each other our pilots licenses after this. Yeah. And, and, which one looks cooler. But, <laughs> really, yeah, nobody else would even know what it is. It's There's, a card there, with a bunch of colors yeah. even if our picture There's no on pictures it. of it. <laughs> it's not even that impressive yeah. to tell you the truth. But one of the things that we really wanna talk to Dave about, because I think this really impacts a lot of people in our, our business is Dave, of course, started out in property management. He still has a very successful property management company, but he's been able to pivot his experience in that industry in several others. And so um, as I meet property managers across the country and in Canada, lots of people are curious how how someone goes from owning a property management company and then take it, takes the leap to other industries or pivots their business into other businesses. And so I think a lot of people will be curious about how you did that. So that's a big concept we want to cover. Um, and Jeremy and I, we've pivoted to Anaquim from property management, which uh, helps property managers secure labor from Mexico for any office job that can be done behind a computer, can be done by an individual professional in Mexico. And so we've been able to make that change. And we just kind of wanted to talk to Dave about how he got started um, with other business ventures. So Dave, how, how did you go from being property management primarily to doing other things? Actually, maybe a step back. How'd you get into property management? That was your first business? Is that true? Sure, yep. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was working for a guy that uh, property management, as you know, is very uh, difficult. It's not a very squeaky clean business Dope. and uh, very challenging. So the guy I was working for, he thought that I'd be a better one running it than him. So we flip roles. I worked for him for three years and we flipped <laughs> and he worked for me for 10. So I bought the business from him and uh, got in the property management business. And as you know, property management is a very, very good business. And the economy at the time was lending itself well towards that because we also were a brokerage firm where we had uh, sales okay. agents. Yeah. Sales. So we would have the guy, the sales guys sell the property management services. And uh, and then so it just, you know, led into, you know, buying properties, which is, you know, obviously typically the next thing for most property managers, they end up, end up owning properties. As you know, the property management business is not very capital intensive. Mm-hmm. It's actually not at all. You don't really need anything 
what do you need an office and a phone maybe a, maybe a dog but mm-hmm. that's it <laughs> so um so yeah so after a while you know paying off the debt from the guy that i bought the business from most property management businesses are you know the seller carries 100 percent of the fine not 100 percent, but they carry the financing because there's no collateral in a property management business other than the contracts which are basically not worth much 30 days yeah right. right so they're really not they're not uh secure but you can't use them as security interest for a bank so started you know saving money i'm a good saver grew up uh, in western nebraska with good mis- midwestern values and just save 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 and started buying real estate and so now so that was a third party management company and then you started buying your own properties you now own more properties than you oh yeah way, way more yeah Is so right? i own 1300 units in oh. addition to Dino Storage, which is huge. Yeah, yeah. Dino Storage, if it's, it's in the a, Midwest. It, so what cities deal. are you in? Uh, we're in Omaha, Lincoln, uh, Des Moines, and Winnipeg, Manitoba. Canada? Yes. Oh, cool. So how, yeah. Long story. <laughs> 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 I don't know. How get, you know, it's actually because I wasn't getting along with somebody, we bought that. So at the time, it was before I built multi-story, and, you know, I thought the prices, this was in 2004, I thought the prices had gotten out of hand in Omaha for land and it couldn't make sense of it and i hadn't really stumbled across this multi-story idea so the supplier was like hey i got this deal in you know winnipeg and the guy that owns it's really not set up for it would you be interested and it's going to take a lot of capital and at the time i had a partner i wasn't getting along with and you know in our dubious wisdom we thought the way to get along was to buy more i mean that doesn't sound like the most <laughs> so that's okay all right so, so yeah like- so we had a lot of money and we didn't know what to do with it and we were finding we were just having really struggling with investment opportunities and so we thought hey the return up here is really good and, you know risk equals return we didn't really understand that and so we you know bought this thing in winnipeg and finished the job for the guy and then my partner melted down of course because you know it did not go well just yeah well, like, it's kind of like get, it's like uh, being married and trying to save the marriage with more kids right yeah exactly similar analogy he, 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 let's see here he really melted down over that whole thing he had about a body experience well he brought him to the table to negotiate and we end up splitting up and we were going to start with me keeping the canadian asset and him keeping the u.s based assets but it ended up me buying all of them and so so yeah you know you know i started off with lots of partners which i think is probably fine you know there's only really three good reasons to have a partner one to share the you know risk two to you know share the you know capital but three is to spend time with people and number three is the only good reason to have a partner that's it. The other two are no good. I mean, if you want if you want to share the risk, just buy something less risky. If you need something less, needs less capital, buy something less expensive. Okay, so that's an interesting. Yeah, point. that that is actually an interesting point. So you obviously had a rough divorce from, from that your guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but your takeaway from that is, uh, if you're gonna have a partner, one of the reasons to be a partner is so that you can be with each other. Yeah, like, right, so no, you're really, talking literally. like friendship. Yeah, no, just fellowship. Yeah, so I just got done with lunch with one of one of uh, the leaders of one of my companies, and and we we think that it's in our best interest, or everybody's best interest, for him and everybody on the leadership team to start on the business. So we're going to start something. We're not exactly sure what's going to go. Is that right? Yeah, but we think we should do it because we want to spend time together. So I mean, we obviously want to make money, but you know, really, it's so we can be together more. So I have so a I question. Think that's a real good reason to be a business partner. And I, and I have a question about that because sure. it, it does sound so much like a marriage. And I'm just wondering if if you start another business with maybe a different group of man uh, of ownership, mm-hmm. do you ever have jealousy issues from the companies that you started previously? With the ownership of those, because you're oh, spending yeah. more time uh, with the well, new owners. I don't have any partners right now, so uh, has that I ever have, become an issue? Uh, that's a good your... question. Never thought of that. No, I don't think so. Most of my partners didn't really want to get out of it, but some of them, most of them, I made them leave. Yeah, but yeah. on good terms. On good terms? Yeah, on good terms. I, You know, I was partners with my dad and my mom for a while. Okay, so yeah, and you property. still talk to them. Yeah, well, I just didn't think that we should continue to be partners, and, you know, it was good. No, it was good. I mean, I have great references for my partners, that's for sure. I currently have no partnerships at all, and this one that I'm thinking about starting is going to be a very small part of what I do. But so then, I mean, that is the test, and I think maybe because I know that there's a lot of people in, especially, you know, in, in my industry, which is property management, where they've gotten into it. one person's more of the congenial type. They are more outgoing. They like talking to people, and the other person is more um, like uh, operational, yeah. more yeah, maybe a little bit technical. Yeah. Maybe better understands the maintenance piece. So they try to bring those skill sets together. But what I like 
what I'm thinking you said is that maybe those aren't the reasons to be no. together. The better reason is, hey, you know what? I, I like waking up. I like you being a part of my day. Right, yeah. Now, I, I think that I'm probably the only person in America, that, certainly on Wall Street, that thinks this way. <laughs> Um, and the way that I do business is, you know, own a hundred percent of everything is very the ordinary. Most people, the partner brings together a bunch of capital, mm -hmm. you know, he's like right. a, you know, a physician a or whatever. And, uh, somebody that has, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, income and they need to invest in something. So they partner with a real estate guy like myself or like you guys. And, you know, you're the expert, you know, what's going on and you understand, you know, where the light switch is at and the difference between a toilet and a doorknob. So... <laughs> Versus, you know, you know, your average whatever, let's say attorney, my brother's attorney, so we can make all kinds of fun of them. They're not going to know the difference between the two. So that's why most partnerships start. And I, I would say 90, gosh, I don't even know, 95% of our real estate's partnered with some sort of partnership, especially in today's environment, especially in hyper competitive markets like Toronto or Jeremy and I are very out of the ordinary from Omaha. We, we have a lot of world experience. That's one of the things we have in common. Most, we do. Yeah. yeah. Most, most kids don't get out of town much. <laughs> well, Jeremy and I get out of town a lot, and we've been all over the world. So that's a little out of the ordinary here. So we look at it more of a world perspective. So a lot of different markets. Well, and let's conjoin two things here because it is odd. Like this, this show is sponsored by Wistar Group, right? And that is a competitor of yours. But I think what I can I can bring these two things together in that like Dave and I like spending time together. We get together for lunch once in a while. Uh, I've had notes. him on now three different shows on radio yeah. over the course of the years, three or four different shows. And it's really it's not about trying to protect your territory. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that uh, and my competitors, which you can tell that story at the, on the other side of the break, which is coming up. Um, I tend to get along with my competitors. There's one in town that I don't much care for, um, <laughs> but 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 it, it, we do kind of keep together. I think it's your mindset is that yeah. the pie can be bigger. The, you don't think yeah. of the pie as being a confined amount of rental properties that you have to fight with each other to get the business. It's like the pie can expand. We all can do different business ventures. We both pivot into other industries even. So why not hang out with a cool person and get their perspective on the industry? And really the only thing you have to do is not be a dick. <laughs> that's it, like that's the rule. Don't be a dick and you're gonna be okay. Anyway, well, welcome back to Bootstrappers. I am uh, again, your host, Jeremy Aspen, the president of Wistar Group in Omaha. And uh, here with my spouse, Gwen Aspen. She's the president of Anaquim LLC. And we're here with our guest, the super. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> no. Dave All right, we'll talk about that. Dave Palladino, who is the president of Landmark Palladino, uh, Landmark Palladino Development and Dino Storage. Those are the storage facilities. Um, uh, Dave uh, was also the property manager. Oh, I already mentioned that. So anyway, we're back. Dave, um, I had a question. Okay, so entrepreneurship. Uh, during the break, you had mentioned something about uh, you start. You've, you're kind of a serial entrepreneur. It's kind of a sickness. Like, sure. So first of all, I guess, have you ever worked for anybody else? Oh, good question. Um, the Well, you know, in college, you know, obviously okay, right. in high school. But I did work uh, for an IBM VAR, it's called, um, selling mainframe computers, which was really helpful later in my career for two years. And you were a double... A W two employee. I was a W two employee. It's a hundred percent commission, but yeah, it's a really good job actually. No, but that's a commission job. That's that's working on your own. Well, so, I, mean, yeah. to, to, I mean, so at least there there were the beginnings of the DNA for entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, it's a good job. I I love talking to people and hanging out and being on the phone and working a lot. So that tends well for a sales guy. So well, it's technical sales. So it's a good job. I learned a lot. You know, I mean, we worked there before the advent of the internet. So. Well, that was one of the things I took away from from corporate world. I worked for international supply chain outfit, a couple of them, and you know, an international supply chain. You're working on production that's going to be taking place in about three months, and you've got to start sourcing all the supplies and materials. So processes and procedures are what I took away from mm -hmm. from corporate life, mm -hmm. and it made a difference because we can incorporate that mentality into our business, which you better, especially with fair housing and things like that. You really want to make sure you're safe. Um, but that, that's that's where the corporate world kind of kicked in for me. But then entrepreneurship, once I got and started working on my own, I, I, I have a hard time imagining going back and working for somebody else. Right. I mean, you were doing it when you were a kid. Yeah, I, I've always been an entrepreneur. I started scrapping metal and 
selling firewood and yeah, I'm definitely cutting lawns. And so this, I, I can't it, imagine. Is it because you like no. the risk? Is a risk just make it interesting to you and it just seems boring if you're working for someone else? My wife would say that it's because I don't like being told what to do. Um, Which? I, you know, I think it's probably true. Did um, you know that about yourself at a young age or uh, was it something? I like to work and the best, I mean, I just, I read a lot too and I'm like a lot, like probably a little unhealthy, you know, when I was a kid. So, and it's obvious, I mean, every book you ever read says work for yourself. So don't work for somebody else. So yeah, I mean, it was so you natural. so more self help books, yeah, or, or self help business. Well, yeah, just you know, I like autobi- I like biographies and autobiographies. You know, and like you know, Neapolitan Hill, Think and Grow Rich, or you know, The Millionaire Mind, or I'm a big Warren Buffett guy too, which is a whole other conversation. But the uh, yeah, I mean, it's just investing in yourself, and you invest in yourself. I mean, you're just going to start working for yourself. I, I can't imagine why you would work for somebody else. You know, my employees probably shouldn't hear that, but. <laughs> No, but I think most people like, it's a personality uh, characteristic. I mean, I suck at working for other people. It was half as motivated working for other people as I am myself. And I can work for other people, but I get very bored very quickly. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, I, I wasn't ever going to be successful at a corporation. Yeah. What I, what I don't like, you know, like, let's just say you do something. I experienced this in grad school. Oh, Hey Dave, let's, you're going to take care of this part of the project. So you do this part of the project and you know, it goes all real good. And then you bring it to the group and they go, Oh, that's interesting. But why didn't you do it this way? Did that you assign me this part of the project? You said to do it this way, or you said to leave it up to me. I did it this way. If you don't like it, do it yourself. So that's what I like about doing doing stuff, you know, working for myself. I did it myself. This is the re- this is the reality of what it is. Take it or leave it. You know, versus you work for some poor slob, you know. Like and he's whoever. And the worst part is, you know, no disrespect for a lot of people really just aren't that smart. And so, especially if they're your boss, you tell them something. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done that? You, were, you ever had that kind of job? You work for that guy. Yeah. And you, you turn in a report. Oh. I had, you know, in, in grad school, I worked for a company, one of my competitors actually, and I turn in this just amazing, amazing work, and I give it to him, and then like, guy, he's like a moron. You know, he understands like ten percent of what I wrote. Forget it. You know, I knew at that point I could never work for. I had, but, a, but, I had a boss like that. I, it just couldn't stand that I was reporting to him, and that that really right. made me work harder to make sure right. that I didn't have yeah. to report to this yeah. douche for very much longer. But, exactly. but with partnerships, uh, I mean, it's not that you work for them, but someone may have a different point of view, and there can be conflict there. Yeah, well, uh, that's just a good partnership agreement. I mean, my I had one partnership where it was equal, but the other ones I wouldn't let it be that way. I I told my last one of my last partners I don't want if I want your opinion I'll give it to you. I mean I don't want your opinion. <laughs> I mean I, if you want a place if you want to go a place where you want to vent your opinion get a dog. You know I I you know not so, in that kind of partner. So if I do, want your opinion I'll give it to you. <laughs> so <laughs> it, in well, your I partnership told him that when I negotiated the agreement when when you do your partnership agreements you always have the majority share. Uh, I have, yeah. That's always been the case. Um, so, but um, I, you got to admit, like all of us here, are entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> um, it, sometimes I, I, I am envious of employees' time off. Yeah, like when yeah. they leave right. the when office, they leave the office, and they are done, and they, their weekends are theirs. Their weekends yeah. are they theirs. Even, they don't even care. They're paid not to. Care. They can have well, that's hobbies. That's right. right so, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, they have hobbies. Um, like I like to go flying, but I haven't flown actually now. Well, that's not, before this last week. I hadn't flown for a couple of months because when the, it's very time. You've concerning. always got a certain stress. And another thing about flying is you don't do it if you're not a hundred percent physically mm-hmm. fit. Yeah, you know, you just want to stay safe. So, and if you're feeling a little tired or you needed to sleep in because it was a rough week, point is have an employee if you're the kind of person that likes to have stability in their life and doesn't want maybe wants a better work-life balance yeah don't own a business yeah don't own a business like that that's one of the that's that's a huge takeaway for me i mean i it makes you reconsider and dave i i feel like you i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i i do think of entrepreneurialism as a sort of disease (coughs) Mm -hmm. because you just can't stop like i always have to be starting another Mm -hmm. company or if i'm not starting a new company i'm starting a new division of the company i already have and 
it's exhausting, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to retire because right. it is a disease. Do you think that you'll ever retire someday or is yeah, this just yeah. who you are and part of your DNA? Yeah, like this. Um, we, we really get into personality profiles. We use either DISC or cultural index. or my Yeah, it's yeah. culture index or cultural people. Index. Yeah, cultural index. What are yeah. you, by the way? Uh, D, you know, high D, obviously. High I. The C and S are going, well, there's no S at all. And Do you know what your archetype going, is in the culture index? Oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, the leader, is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm a leader driven <laughs> leader. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, in that, you know, my, one of our coaches that advises us on that kind of thing says that if you don't have chaos in your life, you create it. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's what mm-hmm. you're talking about, Gwen. Yeah. The disease. So that's why the serial entrepreneur, if we don't have any chaos going on, we'll create it. I mean, that's why you're a pilot. I mean, why else would you do that other than create chaos? Right. Right. Well, yeah, because I went to the doctor one time. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point. I went to the doctor one time and I was I was suffering from oh high blood pressure. I was starting to get some high blood pressure. And he went through a questionnaire. You know, what do you do for a job? Okay, well, I own a business. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, married to Gwen, oh, really so just hard, hard Oh, thing. my God. But <laughs> one of the things he said was, you know, what's the hobby? And I said, flying. And he said, well, Jesus, even even the things that you do for enjoyment are stressful. <laughs> right, because flying yeah. a plane, yeah. it, there are times during flight when yeah. you're the pilot in command right, where yeah. it's stressful. Yeah. Tip, namely the landing. landing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. to some extent taking off. Yeah. Yeah. The landing. Yeah. The, the landing is the, landing. the most. Yeah. So the most do you dangerous. think you could ever stop? Oh, no. <laughs> What's your retirement going to look like? Like when you're thinking ahead. I don't want to retire. You know, I yeah, you're not built for that. it. I'm not going to do that. I want to continue to work. And I really think God's calling me to help people and lead people and create a good work environment and create a job that they couldn't create. I've had several people tell me that their job is the greatest job in the world because, you know, I'm a great boss. And I try to be that way just because I just try to believe in them, which is a problem. You know, I just took over one of the businesses because I'm a little too trustworthy. Mm, That's really a problem for that's me. That's one of my problems. Is that is that I'll assign somebody a task and I don't know how to tell people to fix that but you assign a task and then you think they're going to do it and you kind of think they're doing it correctly but you don't really watch that well i'm really I, that's a problem for me i wish i was a little better leader i was a little, i wish i need to be a little bit more of a micromanager i definitely think that there's a healthy amount of that i don't have enough of it so Is what it about just the following up that you struggle with well like i just the holding trust. Accountable? see and see my problem is once i like somebody it's kind of game over so i like jeremy and he, let's just say that, well, I do like Jeremy and Gwen for that matter, but I do like Jeremy, but once I like an employee and I think I trust him, I give him a huge amount of rope and that's a problem for a boss. Yeah. It really you is. You can't do that. Yeah, well, Jeremy, you do the same thing. I, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't do that. Uh, no, but you've learned from your husband. I have other issues, but that's not one of mine. I'm a pretty good follow upper. But do you ever do you guys use traction or any sort yeah, of a? Okay. I'm really I'm a power, I power traction user. Oh, are you? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I mean, I, I, you know, like it took you it took me a while to figure it out because I've been using traction for maybe eight years, and we had an integrator, uh, you know, a traction integrator and look, facilitator. And, we had a traction facilitator come talk, and his name's Jason McCardle. That guy. Just turn the light on for me. If you don't use traction, you need to use traction. I mean, you hire a facilitator, read the books, go to the seminars. But if you're not using traction, it'll change your life. So let me My just name tell, is, let me, uh, oh, I'm Jeremy Aspen. This Gwen is Gwen Aspen. Aspen. We're uh, here speaking with Dave Palladino. He's president of several companies. And uh, again, we're talking about entrepreneurship. And just so everyone knows what traction is, it's right. really a meeting methodology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it helps uh, businesses hold people accountable with big projects, small to do's in a weekly meeting cadence and also helps you strategize for a year and uh, break up uh, your strategy into quarterly goals. Yeah. Attainable and, goals. And what we found, Jeremy and I have found, is since we started using the traction methodology, we have less on our plate but we actually accomplish more. And so as an entrepreneur, I'm overly optimistic. I think we can get everything done and rainbows and puppies and it's all gonna happen. And Traction helped us be more realistic. And Mm -hmm. also because we were more realistic and the goals were achievable, our people that we were leading believed in us more because Mm -hmm. our say-do ratio was better. Because I think where leaders really lose the respect of their, the people that work for them is when you say you're going to do something and then you don't. Mm-hmm. And then your company has a culture of not having to do anything that you say you're going to do. And so Traction kind of helped me get that under control. Because Jeremy 
thinks everybody's going to follow through, and that's probably your crucial error yeah. as a manager. Mm-hmm. Mine is my say do ratio is bad or has been historically. So I'm I'm get, trying to get better at that. But I think it's like marriage where uh, you have the same fight for the rest of your life. Like mm-hmm. he's messy, I'm clean. And that's never, ever going to change. That will never, ever change. So you kind of have to what? decide what you're, what, what you're, what you want to fight about for the rest of your life when you mm-hmm. get married. Same thing with business. You know that you're always going to have this fault and mm-hmm. you have to hire people who make up for it or just get it at least to a B plus instead of like a C or a D rating mm-hmm. in that area. But yeah, traction is an accountability tool. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, if you if you we we enter traction and the the two two companies, one of the companies that I own isn't big enough to use it, but you know when we enter, when we enter it, both of them started using it. I'm the only one left. Is that right? Yeah, because it's it's a high accountability tool. Don't use it if you want to just go by the easy get by whatever. No, no, no. If you want to lose employees, start losing it because you're going to weed them out. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you you'll you'll start weeding people out because they don't they don't. It's accountability. It's just it's an accountability right. tool through me through like just like Glenn said. Glenn said it's through meetings, tons of meetings, but the meetings are structured and they're meant to do things and they're meant to hold people accountable. You and I'll tell you what, you'll hold people accountable. And you rate the meeting at the end. So if it's right, a boring, yeah. useless meeting, right. it's up to everybody to identify that right, right. after the meeting's over. Right. Yeah. I, and I would also say this, like if there's any, a lot of our listeners, I know use traction, um, but it, it to, to hire a facilitator is thousands of dollars a day. You can just right, read, the you can <laughs> read, read the book. Read read the book. I mean, you you get one, a lot of the same one, stuff. One thing, if you're going to use traction, use all the tools there's what 26 or 30 tools in the toolbox you need to use all of them if you don't use all of them you're not getting the full benefit of traction i speak that <laughs> that's per- right. personal personal experience i didn't use the accountability chart which is basically an organizational chart very well and when i started using that one piece of it it changed everything all right, we're going to uh, be right back after this commercial break we'll be back with dave paladino president of landmark group one of my competitors, Paladino Development and Dino Storage. All right, welcome back, back, back to Bootstrappers. I'm Jeremy Aspen, your host, along with my lovely wife. I'm sorry, my lovely spouse, Gwen, <laughs> Gwen Aspen. She's president of Anaquim, and our guest today is Dave Paladino, who's the president of Landmark, Paladino Development, and Dino Storage. Um, Dave was also the property manager of the reality TV show called The Super, which we're going to get talking about in the next segment yeah and i i just wanted to go back to something we were discussing in the before the commercial break which is traction which is a meeting methodology that a lot of entrepreneurs use it's a book uh written by gino uh, gino wickman who wrote traction and dave was saying that he uses a facilitator for his meetings which is an amazing thing but they can get pretty pricey mm-hmm. So uh, we didn't have the money at Wistar Group years ago when we started Traction. And I used to tell employees all the time, they would say, they would ask a question or they'd be uh, just worried about everything. And I would say, hey, there are no adults. You're actually the adult. Like you have to make a decision. And then I read Traction and I was like, holy crap, this is the adult. This tells us how the meetings run. This is the accountability. And I bought the book for everybody in the office and I said, read it. And nobody read it. And then I just started doing traction meetings and facilitating them myself. And so I think one of the big barriers for small businesses starting this meeting methodology where the meetings are run in a specific way and you go over the KPIs and you go over the to-do list and you go over your quarterly goals and then you discuss everything. The barrier is they think they need to spend all this money on a facilitator when really you just need to spend 1250 on the book read it and then start doing it with your team and holding people accountable. And so um, so that's my that's our traction story. We have used facilitators since and it's definitely an improvement, but you can get a lot of value out of just starting to do it yourself uh, after reading a book. It's an improvement because we end up just bringing in some outside ideas once in a while. And that's important. Otherwise it gets a little bit. And partnerships can get into ruts. And I think one of our issues at Wistar Group is that we just refuse to talk about big issues. Like we're so nice. There were, there were some elephants in the room and we were just like, 
avoid them for months on end and then you get a facilitator and they're they're like a therapist they're like oh i sense an issue here you guys want to talk about it and it forces partnerships to get out of their comfort zone and get real really quickly yeah they do yep so, sorry i got frog <laughs> frog in my throat oh my gosh okay so so but tell us your experience of getting the facilitator dave uh, what, what exactly did they do for you? Well, cu- a couple of things. First of all, I'm in Vistage, so that's a shout out for Vistage. It's a peer advisory board. I think everybody on this should be in one, <clears throat> and whatever that means, you can create your own. You know. Now, so that's a group like mastermind EO, group. a mastermind group. Yeah, EO, it's which Vistage. I think you're an EO. EO entrepreneurs Vistage, organization. Tons of them. Tab. There's a forum. You know, that's where I first started through my church. Started in a forum. Outgrew that. Got in a tab group. Just didn't feel like connected. But then I got into Vistage, which is crazy expensive. Don't even want to tell you how it loud is. how it is, how much it is. But through Vistage, I was exposed to um, Traction and Gino, Gino Wickman. And then at one of you know we had Vistage has a speaker flying from out of town. One of the meetings we had was a traction facilitator Mm -hmm. who was amazing he just turned the light on for me and then i really started understanding it what was it that he specifically did for your meetings that changed well what he he did is he just really he hammered the accountability chart he said you you, you just need to change your it's all accountability chart problem so once you get the accountability chart down i think that's really what led well what was the issue with the accountability well i just didn't have the right people in the right seat and the right roles Mm. and the right descriptions and it's a lifelong process you'll it'll never go away and it's just getting you know when i just took over is that we the integrator most people call it the president for dino storage i took over that in october and so i sat down and you know like all traction guys do i sat, sat down and wrote down what are my goals for my first year so my number one goal was to get the leadership team nailed down and that's I've been finished about that the uh, I've had probably I have seven people on the leadership team not including myself and I've had probably eight positions turnover one of them four times so, so is the deal yeah. that with the accountability chart is that before you really got it nailed down was loyalty the biggest reason someone would be on your oh, leadership yeah team and now it's about their skill set or no. personality no, or it's about getting stuff done it's about accountability here's here's your five rocks or here's your five roles here's your five roles are you doing those five roles no you know i'm all about are you meeting the great thing about traction you have your five you know you have five rocks five roles five core values and you just rank people on them and then when you do the accountability tracker which is another tool which is awesome you just rank them on them and the people when you rank them they do terrible and so why is it terrible let's talk about that and then you're not getting your rocks done you're not even getting your to-dos done to-dos are rocks are quarterly to-dos are weekly you know, list of things to do. You're not getting them done. Why is that? So explain that. I had one guy working for one of my companies. He's the integrator of that company. And then, you know, you know, none of this to do, he's making no progress on the rocks quarterly. And then just keep adding to the dues. His to dues were two pages long and you come to the next meeting and none of them were done. You're kidding. You're fired. You know? So how long do you give people with coaching? How long do you spend time coaching someone before you decide this is just not working out? That's a problem. I'm not, I, I, you I, don't, just, coach I well. don't do that. I mean, I do a little bit, but I, I need to do better. Although I have a new marketing person at Dino's and she's killing it, you know, so I don't put very much time into her. I apologize incessantly about that, that I just don't spend the time with her because she's killing it, you know? And so I think if you have to really coach somebody, they're probably not the right fit anyway. And the previous person, that guy was a moron. No disrespect <laughs> for the guy. I hope he's not <laughs> no, listening. I'm sure he's... <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs> it was just, I mean, uh-huh. it's about accountability. You need to create accountability. Here's your to-dos. You need to get these done when? Today, all of them today, and then tomorrow you're going to redo all of them again. Yeah. We need, we need, I mean, if all these entrepreneurs listen to this thing, create a, an environment of high accountability. And that one of that is big list of to-dos. Well, doesn't know? that also give the employee an opportunity to feel like they're accomplishing something and to make themselves better and a better, uh, a more efficient component of the team anyway? Like, it, by holding somebody accountable, would you agree that in so doing, you're making their life better? Way easier. Yeah. Easier, Your expectations stable. set out, yeah. So I, I think it's just having a really good roles. The f- every 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 person in your organization should have five main roles. And that those roles are basically just what they do every day. So like five procedures that they're no. responsible okay, for. Okay, so so the I'll just do for Dino Storage, the marketing coordinator. One of her role is to post on social media. That's one of her roles. 
every you know and then she has a list of everything to do another one of her roles keep the website updated another one of her roles is the community partners people ask for free, free storage that's another one of her role another of her roles is to organize community events which is out the window because of COVID-19 which is about to give us a heart attack you know so she has five of these roles mm. everybody has you know roles and then quarterly you rake them on their roles you know one to five so we have a little ranking system it's really easy to do KPI is associated with each of these yeah right. yeah yeah KPIs, key performance indicator. In which, you know, if you guys are listening to this, you need to have as many leading indicators as you can. We don't have enough leading indicators or action-based, lagging indicators or just pass-based. So, which is a problem. It's really hard to come up with leading indicators at all. It's almost impossible. They say it should be 50-50. Are you kidding? It's There's hard no to come way. up with just a few of them. You know, right? <laughs> it is. I can maybe come up with like three. And then we have like 30 other ones. <laughs> it's a, pro- it's a yeah. problem. And then, you know, these facilitators, yeah, I, they come to you and they say, oh, you need more leading indicators. I know that. <laughs> but I, I know you- that. They should be 50-50. You have 20 lagging and three leading. That's all I could think of. Well, it's hard you know? to tell the future, right? I mean, yeah. you can't. nobody's yeah. good at telling the future. But if you do have some indication of where things are going before the end of the month, you might be able to turn what would otherwise be a bad month into... A good month. I'm Jeremy Aspen. I'm with here with my spouse, Guinevere Aspen. And uh, this is Bootstrappers interviewing Dave Palladino, the president of Landmark Group Palladino Development and Dino Storage. And we're talking about, well, attraction meetings, but entrepreneurship. Just meetings in general and and managing people. And so you were talking about coaching. Uh, So I'm a big into coaching and growing individuals. It's one of the things that brings me joy. And one of the issues we had is our director of uh, the administration department, She her accountability chart, we asked her to get her job description down and put it into oh, this- software. And she had all the responsibilities on her shoulders and all of her team were helpers. And it just took a little bit of coaching for her to understand what she was doing wrong there and to give more um, rope to her employees. But it was just a quick little tweak, and I think she's going to be way better at her role after just a you know thirty minutes of coaching, and and so that's where I feel like the coaching comes in uh, because it's not it's a lot of stuff that we've learned we've learned the hard way by making mistakes, and until they make the mistake or someone coaches them before they make the mistake, they're not going to know how to grow into the role that they're in now. So tell me what you think about this when we were having that conversation with the. The way that I um, delineated it for her was to say that, you know, if she asks me to do something and I do it, that is a leading indicator that she might um, not be that important to me. That she's whereas, about to get fired. Because- that maybe get fired. Whereas if I take the time to schedule a meeting and have a conversation and walk her through it, that's an indication that I still trust and believe her and that she needs to kind of push that down to her own group. So when they're asking her to do something, don't do it. Like teach them, take every opportunity you can. It'll take 10 times longer to train somebody than just to do the work. But when you can, make sure you're passing that on to, you take the time, you respect them enough and let them know, signal to them that they're important enough to uh to train to learn and, I thought that was and learn and grow approach. Mm-hmm. i agree that was yesterday yeah yeah, wasn't it? It yeah was that like, was yesterday yeah. It hit. so uh because i mean i've taken on new roles and i didn't i had to fall on my face a few times before i got it down and i you know unless you're from a family of business people or entrepreneurs that talk about it all the time i think a lot of people have the raw talent but they just don't have any of the experience or you know the knowledge of of how to how to actually put that raw talent into action. Agreed. Tell me I this. Agree. So when you because you've had a couple of other ventures too, and I know this about you because we're friends. But you've had towing companies. You've mm-hmm. I mean actually, why don't you say how many companies have you had? Oh my goodness. Um, so I was a hard money lender, which is a really good business. Uh, but my partner didn't want to do it anymore, and it's not the kind of thing where the person running the business needs to be one of the owners. No. Then I owned a towing business, which I still do, but I only do, do it for myself, but I stop doing it for other people. Okay. I just do private property towaways. That's a really good business, actually, um, for tenants to leave their cars behind, which is you know a really good business. 
Um, I was a contractor for a while, you know, maintenance contractor. GC stuff? Yeah. Okay. Um, before I bought the property management business. Cars? That was not mine. I rented the guy. I let him use my name, which was a mistake. Okay. I know how to do everything cr- incorrectly. Hey, that's <laughs> how you, that, how to, you whittle away. How to all do the... it correctly. I'll tell you how to do it incorrectly. Okay, you that's know. good advice. Yeah. That's what you. Yeah. That's what a lot of people pay for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, am tell I thinking about do doing wrong. this? So I did that. Okay, <laughs> bad move. Yeah, so, so how did you end up deciding to winnow away to to start? Because it's you, you've well, brought it down I, to three I, companies well, and they're yeah, all kind of related. Three. And I, you know, the the property management we've done this for so long that guy's worked there forever and it just you know does well. So I mean that always helps. So and he's worked there for twenty years, so that certainly helps. And the Dino storage, I mean, it just kind of fell into that, you know, in the residential I've always done. Is that right? You just why. fell into that? Because that ended up being a huge part of your yeah, portfolio. Yeah, that's a big part They're of what beautiful. I do. Yeah, a big part of what and I do. And they look nice. Like yeah, you I were like before you. our board. Yeah. And it make, I'm on the Zoning Board of Appeals here in the city of Omaha, and your, your team came up and, and they presented this building in, in an area that was, you know, people didn't want it to look worse. But your buildings don't look worse. They, they don't look right. like a store. They don't look like a one-story facility. Yeah, they look. Really yeah. They look yeah. Yeah. They're really pretty. Like a hotel. Yeah, it looks like a multi-story hotel or an office. Yeah. Yeah. Final segment of Bootstrappers. I'm Jeremy. This is Gwen. Our last name is Aspen. We're here with Dave Palladino, president of Landmark Group, Palladino Development, and Dino Storage in the United States and Canada. Um, so, I know a lot of our listeners uh, recognize you as the super. The Super was a, what kind of show is that called? A reality, a reality television TV show. show. Non-scripted. And, and, and non, unscripted. And uh, so Dave, basically the show was, they would follow, the camera crew would follow Dave around and he would run into these crazy things that would happen at his properties. He would deal with them. It was, it was an interesting show. So how does somebody reach out to a property manager and say, hey, do you want to be on a TV show? No, that's definitely a God thing. So how how the whole thing started is um, Phil Stenberg, who has a wildly successful short called Working Moms now. He's related to this guy, I, Ivan, Ivan Eichmann, maybe? He's the guy that uh, produced uh, Ghostbusters and oh. Stripes and a lot of movies like that. Right. Well, anyway, so this guy knows a lot of people. Anyway, his cousin comes to him and says, hey, I got this great idea for a reality TV show. And he lives in Chicago. His cousin lives in Chicago, and so they went and followed him around. You know what? That's a really good idea to do a TV show based off a landlord and their tenants, but you're not the guy to do it. So he went back to the office in California and uh, in Hollywood, and they were talking about, okay, what 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 is the what is their idea? So they were brainstorming and thinking about one, and one of the guys was from Red Oak, Iowa, and they really thought they liked the Midwestern kind of component because mm-hmm. like, it's not what you expect from a Midwestern town. So they really thought, which Midwestern town should we pick? The guy goes, well, I'm from Red Oak. Omaha's close. No, oh, that sounds interesting. So they type in property manager Omaha and. Your Jeremy, SEO is amazing. What? Your Jeremy SEO is fantastic. Yours came up. Your, mine came <laughs> Were up. Were they looking up yours. crap? And at the time, <laughs> at the time, I was killing it with SEO for property management in Omaha, and I had a full time girl working on it. So they called the office, and I struck it off, struck it, struck it, you know, up with the guy, and he said, "Well, why don't I come to town?" And and so we did a sizzle. Guy named uh, a Charles. Sizzle, that's yeah. industry speak for yeah. <laughs> it's brainstorm. Like, well, it's kind of like a little short, one or two minute little kind of oh. thing. Oh, okay. And so they did the sizzle, and we did that in 2009, and uh, a long time ago. And uh, he, you know, they, they went and took it to all these different uh, networks and a lot of different networks. And they knew that some of them may steal the idea. Spike TV came up with the world's worst tenants out of the whole idea, and that didn't really go anywhere. But he, he got, he convinced TLC to pay for a pilot. Cool. So in 2010, he came back. Charles came back with another guy, and we over a week produced the pilot. So the pilot was scripted. Oh, Nobody's really? Ever seen the pilot? I can't find the pilot, which is really. It, it was totally scripted. It was totally scripted, not like what you saw. So it was the only thing. My wife was on it too, which is interesting because she was <laughs> never on the any of the episodes. So we did a, a scripted TV show, and we took it back to TLC, and they said, "Well, that's a good idea, but we just don't think you can do it." Not me, but you know the guys that are producing it because it was their first show. And so, so then they went out to a bunch of networks and they asked all of them and they convinced uh, uh, what became Access TV, HDNet, owned by Mark Cuban, to buy two, uh, two seasons. And they, cool. Oh, so they bought two seasons right from the get-go. Yeah, right at the beginning. And then you committed. Yeah, we committed to two seasons. So we knew we'd do two right at the beginning. So, okay, I don't mean to change this, but about, I mean, that, was all, that had to have been a lot of work. Yeah, so it was from May till the end of September, eight hours a day. 
Wow. Which it was Friday. May to September, eight hours a day of filming yeah, and yeah. looking for things to do. Well, that was a lot of work. I mean, there's just, I mean, we'd sit around in meetings and talk about what to go after and go talk to tenants. It was, and then a lot of filming, obviously. Did I mean, it? Did it work as a good marketing tool for your I business? I know. Some people really, you know, if I go to the, you know, Iron events and they'll look at me, oh, great, there's a super. <laughs> <laughs> Iron is our industry group. <laughs> Can we show him the door? Does he have to be here? He doesn't really make the business look all that interesting. So, Oh, it made our business look <laughs> interesting. But, but yeah. as far as people who want you to rent or, you know, manage their properties, uh, did it kind of give know, you a cachet maybe, that you didn't have before? Maybe, you know, maybe. Pro- probably in the balance, yes. But it wouldn't be worth paying for. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, taking that kind of time. Yeah. Fell into your lap. Yeah. I mean, it would. I mean, they've seen, you know, we're we're like Jeremy said, highly, highly likely to be recognized outside of Omaha, especially at hotels. Oh, when I would go to some of our industry stuff, they're like Omaha, Nebraska. Do you know the super? Yeah. It's like, oh, good. Yeah, Yeah, I do. I I mean, it was only out there for two years, but it must have been widely popular. And then in 2000, let's see, what was that? Three years ago? Yeah. 2000. 16, it, it came out of Netflix and my, my world melted down. Yeah, I happened? really had to be careful when about you leaving mean? the house. Well, I couldn't leave the house. Really? Well, no, you everybody, were everywhere, everywhere I go, I, knew, I mean, it's Netflix, you know, so everybody recognized me everywhere I went. Wow. Kind of, no and I didn't mind that. I actually kind of appreciate it. And I decided early on, if anybody wanted to talk about it, I'd, I'd talk about it. Well, that was a good thing to be like, if you end up in the limelight, because I was for a little while locally in politics, yeah. you do have to know what you're willing to say. Yeah. What, and if you're willing to talk to people about yeah. it, if you're willing to engage in conversation. Yeah. But yours would have been like, what kind of conversation? Well, they just they always wanted to talk about the characters. And sometimes that would hard, be hard for me to remember sometimes because a lot of tenants and it was just the, some of the tenants we filmed. So I I always I decided I just didn't want to be that guy. People flew to town to meet me. We always accepted them. And people, is that right? Yeah, that was pretty common. So yeah. I'm Jeremy Aspen. This is Gwen Aspen. This is Bootstrappers, and we're here with Dave Palladino, aka the Super. Sorry about that. Got to no make sure everyone knows who we're talking to. Okay. I think I'm going to um, send this video, this uh, segment, on to my uh, b- friends in the business too, just yeah. so they can. Because they do. When I go to these uh, shows, yeah, um, they wonder, like, well, whatever happened to the super? They loved it. Yeah. Did you have a goal with the show, or well, it was just I kind to of make a, a fun lot of money? Really, you know, because I'm a capitalist pig at heart. So let's just face <laughs> it. I thought. I mean, the, and the numbers they were throwing around were big numbers, and it was definitely enough to catch my attention. But then it never really worked out that way. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, I mean, I don't think they necessarily... I, I really like the guys that, you know, Phil Stenberg is the guy that came up with the idea. He's a great dude, man. I really... Hard work. I'll tell you what, hard Hollywood means hard work. Anybody in Hollywood. I'm not talking about the talent. I'm talking about everybody else. Everybody else. Super talented workers. All the creative mm-hmm. people. And the hours they put in so much work. Is that right? It is so impressive. It is just impressive. They have such passion. The pay is absolutely atrocious, but they are so talented. Did you ever meet people that are just good at what they do? Yeah. It's that's very yeah. inspiring. And, and, it's very, you know, it's Glenn, inspi- that's, it's yeah. inspiring. Um, her name was Leslie Coffey. She was the executive uh, producer of the second season. She is the most God-given talented person to what she was doing I'd ever met in my entire life. She was so good at what she did. That was, just like Gwen said, it was inspiring. She was so good. And she loved it. So, from that experience, did it turn into anything else that changed your life in any way? Well, okay, so it didn't. Well, everybody knows who I am. Yeah. You know (laughs) How's that money structure work? Like, so you work, you get two years in, eight hours a day, May to, I think you said September. Yeah. And so is the hope that they'll, uh, three more seasons will be picked up, you're paid per season? How's that? Uh, well, okay, that so like? how that worked is I, I didn't want to do a third season. I didn't want to do a second season, but we committed to it. And so I, I really was very hesitant to do that. And I even asked, I talked to him about maybe like not doing it, even though we agreed to do it to okay. do it but but lisa my wife is the world's biggest super fan so that she really wanted it so that second season was really for my wife because <laughs> well, hey, my wife is 100 percent and you love moved her to, yeah movie star so it's the right kind of wife to have so <laughs> they say, literally they, their husband's a movie star so <laughs> but then the third season we weren't committed i i i told phil i, I don't want to do it you know i i just i don't want to i mean maybe if they came and offered stupid money and he goes, well, I'll tell him you don't want to do it. And so he told, he went to him and said, you don't want to do it. And that was the end of was your the end of the television super. career. Yeah, but my was, kids are pretty upset about you, would that. Would you take it back? 
You know, we've talked about it. I have somebody that would produce it here locally, a gal that would love to produce the show. Of course, raising the money to do it's another matter, but I, I just, I'm too busy. Yeah. And plus, I love to fly, and I spend a lot of time at the lake. Amen, my, brother. With my kids yeah, and my grandkids. Yeah, good lifestyle. And yeah, I just don't, I mean, it's a lot of work. And I mean, now, I mean, and I have a good job, and I mean, if if it paid really well, Jeremy, I'd do it. But you know what? You know what's cool about and being an entrepreneur? You can put that in your book of things that you've done. Right. Yeah. yeah. Most people haven't yeah, done. Yeah, how many people have produced a reality TV yeah. show? Yeah. yeah. And that's be super a pretty fun. small list. <laughs> just one of many successes you've yeah. had in your, uh, in your career, yeah. so... We have got to wrap it up. Uh, this is Bootstrappers. I'm Jeremy Aspen. This is the, my uh, spouse, Gwen Aspen. And Bootstrappers is an Anaquim LLC production. Anaquim helps property managers with all their office labor needs with high quality remote labor from Mexico. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, for coming. thank you, really Dave. Yeah, thank you. That was good stuff. Fun. Yeah, I always like this kind of thing. All right. Have a great one. Thank you. Yeah, have Thanks, a good everyone. one, Dave. Bye. This has been Bootstrappers, a unique presentation designed to help you better understand what makes the world turn. Contact Gwen or Jeremy Aspen at hosts at bootstrapper.club. Join us next time on News Talk 1290 KOIL at our website or download the podcast.